from specialisation? Like, is it always? Do you always have to um, specialise and alienate in order to professionalise? Or is craft a different way of professionalising? I think, I think if you want to get really good at something, you have to specialise. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but then once you, once you get to a certain level, that skill set starts to overflow into different areas, you know. So, like, we're really good at making satchels, but we've been really good at making satchels for 20 to 30 years. And now we make everything. We make golf bags for head, we make belts for Armani, we do all kinds of third party manufacturing mm -hmm. as well. So, it's kind of actually specialised, yes, master your craft in one area, but then master, you learn to master the flows because, oh, I have to go that. And again, you just to swim, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's kind of, I've not done that before, but I think we can do it, you know. And I'll tell you what, I'll make you some prototypes. You know, what makes us special is we're really a, a, a rapid prototyping lab. You know, it's, it's producing world-class prototypes. That's, that's what we do. Every one is a world-class standard. We want them. You know, and, and I think that's the future of kind of small-scale manufacturing. I'm interested in that deep specialisation because um, I too have to do a PhD and that kind of deep specialisation I say I'm doing, I kind of put it on hold for three years, which is a stupid idea. Don't do that, don't do that now. I do that. I've got a great, got a great job, that's, you know, it's fine. Um, but within that deep specialisation, there's a kind of, I'm wondering how that deep specialisation of your PhD and of that kind of research based approach is informing your designing now and I know it's not necessarily separate but it's different. Uh, yeah I like to try and pretend the PhD never happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no no of course there's, <laughs> there's, things I've, there's things I've learned from the PhD like a lot of the stuff we do now at Uniform has very rigorous research like we won't start making anything unless we've proven a particular problem and we've got a particular insight that we want to address and we'll create something around that. Um, so that it has, everything I've done has, I feel like there's been a progression in my career. Everything has informed the next step that I've gone along. So I've never been in like the place of education. For me it's kind of learning, learning how to make and deep specialising from a maker back then. Mm -hmm. What gives you a trade secret? Yeah. That's what sets your product. It's kind of little edges that you get. The problem is, it's like when I make something, it's like, and then someone else makes the same thing, but I've got all them, they have done that 30 times, and they've tried out 120 different techniques on how to dye that piece of leather that way, and then they'll, to get that colour that rich, we're going to do it like this. And that gives you a massive edge, but it's hard in a, in a maker space. Like, I, I, I give, everyone says to me, you give away too much knowledge, you know, I just like sharing and it's kind of, but it does give away, you know, a lot of them, you know, things that, like, there's 12 satchel makers in the UK now, five of them, I help get set up. <laughs> <laughs> so we get, I give, I give them patterns, because we were the only guys left, it was on our shoulders to keep it going, you know, it's like, listen, and do you know what the beauty of that was? <coughs> it's like, it's an industry now. One guy in Liverpool when he was at church, it's like, he seems a bit weird. You know what I mean? It's like someone was talking before about the gym membership, and I, I can really relate to that. You know, it's like, yeah, it's a bit weird, that guy. It's like making satchels. When everyone else starts doing it, they're going, oh, these are great. They last forever, and they're really useful, and I get it now, you know, and it's kind of, so I think sharing that knowledge and that deep specialisation, if you can share, I guess that's similar to the period of speaking and philosophy. I think you'll sell them McDonald's. No. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I can totally relate to what you're saying because my PhD was a practice based PhD, so I didn't have to do much writing. I ended up doing way too much writing. But the, the bulk of the work was doing stuff with my hands, and that's what I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the start of that PhD when I was just making stuff, and I was like, I needed to experiment with printing distance sensors with conductive ink and I would just screen print hundreds of different patterns just to see which one was working best without any sort of scientific rigour. It was just experimenting and just kind of going with what I thought was right. Um, so yeah, that was a good bit.
<laughs> I didn't mean to bring up like a terrible source of it, but um, I was quite interested in what you were saying about being a single-handed craft person, because I think that kind of that knowledge that you carry in your hands as a craft person is really important, mm -hmm. and isn't is communicable, but only in very specific. It's not really scalably commodifiable in quite the same ways. And it's, it's hard. I mean, so I have sort of I was speaking to a lady earlier. You know, one of the challenges we have is that there's lots of people who want to learn Minecraft, uh, but there's not many people. Who can, so 16 year olds come to cook up, and we work with like uh, Studio Bay, Sandman and Labour Tree Technology Park. So we get lots of kids coming from there going, Yeah, I'd love to come and work for you kids, do an apprenticeship. It's like, what do we get at the end of it? And I'm like, Nothing. <laughs> there's no qualification in like, the work in the UK at the moment. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, right, okay, well, I can't do that. I said, I can give you warehousing a little bit, or maybe some office admin MVP, but it's not what you're actually doing. So that's the challenge, you know. Yeah. I mean, we have, so it's like trying to, we've got our own apprentice here, and communicating that is something I've developed over the last 20 years of teaching people. And I'm now trying to look at how can I digitize this and, and me, and teach them, and do this kind of course where it's like, I've got three people who are apprentices now, they're all 30. They've all got PhDs and they're going, yeah, I don't care about paperwork, I just want to work with you, you know, and that's like, it's, it's humbling, it's really humbling because they see that, you know, they get to work, the product's beautiful to work and it's lovely to make. And this comes from when you, when you make a product from start to finish, you take a raw material and you make something, you make someone's life better because of it, you know, it's, and I feel it would be good, you know, you produce sustainable products. So, I'm, and this is why I keep <laughs> But yeah, how, how do we scale it? I, th I think the only way you can scale it is, is sharing the knowledge, but you still always need a master leader, and you always need someone who's, who's done the groundwork or trained with someone, you know. Is it, a mind, is it a mindset issue? Do you have to get people with the right mindset to be able to keep it? Yeah, you, 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 you do, yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's big issues. Is first of all, parents don't want their kids in the production. Yeah, we're not really a factory, but a lot of people come in. I've not been in the factory, and it's not a factory. I've seen factories, our place isn't a factory, and it upsets me when you call it a factory. It's a workshop, we have benches, you know what I mean? There's no line, there's benches, tools on, you know, so anyhow. <laughs> um, but yeah, you've got a problem, and then there's mindset as well. So the, there is times when it is quite monotonous, but like stitching the back. I mean, you do a stitch, you can take it. If you were to hand stitch, start with a saddle stitch, it would take you probably about 45 minutes to an hour. The whole bag would probably take the best part of two days if you were to hand stitch your yeah, three stitch leaves on the machine. So it's machine stitch, but it's done by hand. Um, but most people can't endure that. You know, most people just won't go really like a board now. So you've got this whole culture problem of you know, it's like, where do we get that from, you know? You know, so, and, and then you'll find the older people are like, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, it's just so satisfying and rewarding to do it, you know, so it's, it's different. But that sort of way of working must really tie into what's been talked about a lot, right? Through that storytelling, that idea of telling a story of, this is what the product is, this is who's made it, and that kind of authenticity. Where if when you start to scale up that story, although you can still keep a story, I'm sure. Well, I, I, have, I have two people in our team that purely work on digital. So if I, we don't have a marketing budget, but I have two digital people. So they come in, they take photography, they, they put together kind of stories and campaigns and stuff like that, and then they're in there and they can take videos and we'll post them online, or we'll take pictures of customers' bags as they're being made and we'll post them to customers. And, there's lots that goes on that people don't see behind the scenes. And trying to make that whole process a lot more transparent, so using text, so as a bag's been cut, we're going to put an NFC chip in it. And then as it kind of goes through different stages in the workshop, we're going to use cameras to trigger and take pictures of, of the bag actually being made and then embed that kind of that, a link to that content on the NFC chip. So when you get your bag, you scan it with your phone and you can watch it being made. You you know? Yeah, and then you'll know who made it and where I'm going to like this leather's this leather's from Titanium in Scotland, that buckle there, that's from Lutzwood, that's from Abbey Saddlery. 
I've got the clip first from my mom in Yorkshire, you know, so it's like I can, I can tell so much kind of story about where I came from. But tech enables us to do that, you know, it's not, and, you know, there's changes happening, but perhaps we have to evolve with that. Because someone said earlier, it's all about storytelling, everything is about the story. We've got three questions. Let's start here. From there. I was just slightly interested you said about having to adapt to the same skills. Does that um, sort of move through into the actual physical making, or are you seeing that as something that um, Yeah, it does. So we're finding, like, we use laser cutters for some things, because some things you just can't cut with yeah. a craft knife, not to the standard you need, not as a one off. And in the past, you'd make tooling, you'd get like a dye knife and stuff to do the intricate work, but it's just too costly when you're making one of them. So it's it's kind of lasers help us do a lot more things with it. We also do um, so we also use uh, UV printers to do digital timing on some items as well. So people can send us a photo, and we can digitally tell of hacked a, 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 a flatbed. A uh, sign printer mixed it with leather pigments and Chris Packet polymers, so it can print directly onto leather. You know, so people can send us a photo and then we can, we, we can put whatever you want or artwork from a, an art degree and then we can make a product out of it. There's things we do, yeah, so it is really changing the landscape of what we do. across 
the UK or even the world, so somebody might be developing some sort of digital element, somebody's doing circuit board, somebody's doing some sort of injection molding somewhere else, and I don't know, I feel like I'm not that comfortable doing it yet. Yeah. Um, maybe that's what it is, maybe I just, I feel like I'm learning a lot. Since we're in uniform, this is something we're trying to do, and we're maybe not necessarily equipped to do it quite yet. Yeah. We're going to have to do a lot of learning before it becomes something that feels natural and normal. Yeah. There's an element of mastery to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know if I'm necessarily the person to do that because I like to make stuff. I don't want to be the project manager style person that needs yeah. to have a deep understanding of making as well, but I want to do that. Yeah. I guess it comes down to the sort of conflicts you're having. I don't want to be the person that's organising everybody else. Yeah, and that makes sense. I think it also comes into that. that me yeah. not trying to challenge with this single person. Mm -hmm. It's that like we all want to be then. They don't exist. And it's like, uh, I'm cheating because I'm not that guy in a little shirt and everything. Yeah. Like, no, I've got machines. <laughs> you know? yeah. and I, I think, you know, you feel like you're a fraud or not, but you're not. You've just got to challenge that meme. Yeah. You're just, just not the meme because the passion is yeah. someone else. You know? It's mentality. The materials are changing. Yeah. Like, yeah. when I was doing my PhD, the materials were technology. It was conducted ink. It was whatever. Yeah. 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 You had a question here. Then over there, then that's better. Who's next? Then Dominic. Well, okay. 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 Hey. Yes, you're right. Okay. Um, so it sounds like the problem is, as we all know, is that people don't value, you know, made stuff as much. They just see a product and they go, well, that's that price, that's that price. So how can you? make something more sustainable. If you're going to have a bag that lasts 20 years, is there a way to pay for another 20 years or you go back and get it fixed or it's like a... So you, would, you know, people buy a piece of art for huge value because they see it in a totally different way. So how can you shift that to be seen in a totally different way? So for instance, just very quickly, architects and I are talking about instead of just being paid a design fee, the building is like a royalty, so if that performs, they get royalty of the value of that building, which is a totally different way of seeing themselves because they're getting pushed out of construction. So is it a way that you, we could change that value? I, I've looked at you know, subscription models for bags. I've seriously looked at that because the PayPal enables that really, really easy and stuff like that. But it becomes really hard because people, their expectations of the product be different to what the actual product is and then you've got that whole challenge which when you've made and driven then margins are not there you know it's, it's kind of you, you're tight you're running a business and it's really really hard and you can't take risks like it'd be nice to try but we just can't do it you know so we keep our prices as low as we can to capture as much of the market as we can you know what i look at us you know i always call products like one percent five percent twenty percent products so, 1% you have and 5% you do with the top, 20% you have like this actual company. You know? So it's that kind of price point where you are with the, with the people who can afford them. And we always try and become, we're, we class ourselves with affordable luxury. We're not really a luxury product, we're a utility product, but people think we're luxury because they may, well, you know, they may to last. But I, I don't know how you, you challenge that, how you step that up, whether you can spread that out, I, I don't know. So, just very quickly, I know someone who made a bag for someone out of their cat, and the value of that, I know it sounds really mad, but that's what they wanted, yeah. <laughs> she made something out of cats, so the value of that is like, that's my cat, like, oh my god. It's <laughs> 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 a way to make, it's a way to make your bag like a living thing, and have a sense of it, if it was, you, I don't know, is there a way to totally interrupt spot? So anyway, I'll, I don't know if there's an answer. Subscription model is a pet based. I think I think in the future when weather becomes more scarce. So as as we move away from kind of bovine production, like leather cow life right now, masses of it, there's loads of it, there's been tons of beef. That's gotta stop. We can't sustain that. So as we move away and we move to meat alternatives, that bovine ladder is going to become a lot more expensive. And then the role of the people making with that ladder is then a lot more crucial. 
because you've invested in a, in a product that has a lot of value. So I think that will change things as well. You know, the prices of craftspeople being able to work, like the best <coughs> being able to work leather, the value of them individuals will, will increase a great deal, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's go back to your um, NFC process. So, um, about loved items, I think, actually. So, we've got a separate of our shipping containers, it's about pre loved toys. People kind of say there's no room for this in the house anymore. And so, a while back, we were like, well, how can we tell a story of toys and technology? So, similar yes. questions, but none of the money to put behind creating the process that you just described. Yeah, so, so, this bag is normally on my wall in our flagship store and on the dock. I am currently using my granddad's bag normally from day to day. And it's, it's on his initials, I'm CRH, Crystal Mum, and I'm sure I'm going to ask you. What's your real name? You know, I'm like, I don't realize it's about the kids, but the sea or whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, ask my you know what I mean? And it's like, but that techno technology enables that storytelling. Yes. It was originally sold, it was sent back, we had this repair here, this happened. And then at the end of life, when that bag's absolutely dead in 80 years, I can then turn it into a notebook for my great grandkids. Do you know what I mean? Yes. That chip still tells that story. So you know? we did into this. So we started looking in. You know, who's doing something with the kind of tracking of objects and items? Not, there's a couple of companies out there. So you've got Providence.org, but that's more about mass, mass manufacturing products. And there's a company in the US called securitycheck.com. It's doing an NFC job. Hyatt Jeans made something which I helped build. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't use NFC, but it just used a code printed on each jean. Yeah. And as a picture would be taken, and as the pair of jeans was being made, it's they made in Wales. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I don't call that. I think one of the things that's. Throughout it, 
And then on your side, the, that notion that I could come back to you with my bag that's a little bursting, and you you hold that story that you're trying to put on NFC. So it's, it's somewhere in between where you can tell a story about the iterative process. You can have 300 maquettes on the wall that say, we started there and we ended up here. Yeah. That worked, that didn't, that, and, and walk through it. And you can do exactly the same for every stitch on that bag. And there's somewhere in between, I actually think between the two of you, you've got a compromise situation that you would then say, actually, I can help you. I'd like to, I actually mean the two of you. And um, I think there's something where you can um, just share that. Because I, I've got handmade bags. I just looked around and I've got a man for one, not a handmade one with me. Um, but I go back to the same guy and he says, oh yeah, that's still not quite right, that little bit. And he unpicks it. And it's, it's somewhere in between that don't want to lose what you're retaining on a personal level by it being not you. Does that make that? I don't know if that makes sense. But. I'm very conscious that you have to either pick up a dog or a daughter. I didn't quite clock which one. It's in a, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> you may leave it. It's all consistent. You may leave it. Time wise, in general, you've been brilliant, both of you. Thank you. Um, but I think we should move straight into the next panel. So if our next panelist could come up, we can do a big round of applause. <laughs>